Good evening. Can you hear me? Okay. I'm Tom Maloney. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Economics and an investigator with the Institute of Public and International Affairs here at the University of Utah. And it's my privilege to welcome you to the fourth annual International Conference on Human Rights, Conflict Resolution, Nonviolence, and Peace, presented by the Barbara L. and Norman C. Tanner Center for Nonviolent Human Rights Advocacy. Dean David Rudd of the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences had planned to be here tonight, uh, but had to go to Washington on short notice, so he can't be here, uh, but I'm pleased to be able to, uh, to take over these duties uh, in his place. This year's conference, as you know, is on controlling sexuality through violence, shame, and cultural oppression, implications for human rights. Those of us who live in Utah, and even uh, if there are folks who don't live in Utah, know that these issues have had particular prominence here uh, in the past year or so, but of course they play out in different but related ways nationally and internationally. And a great emphasis of the Tanner Human Rights Center and of these conferences is to make connections between the global, the national, and the local manifestations of controversies and challenges related to human rights. And also to make connections between academic work, policy, and outcomes in the local community. As in past years, these connections are visible throughout the conference program which combines our very distinguished keynote speakers, outstanding scholars from around the nation and from many departments here at the university, and several leaders in the local community who are engaged with uh, issues of sexual identity and human rights. Bringing people together from such a variety of backgrounds to share their expertise and engage in conversation about fundamental issues of human rights, this is some of the most important work that a university can do. Our ability to engage in this work here at Utah is a direct result of the generosity of Barbara and Norman Tanner and Deb Sawyer. I want to thank them for their vision in establishing the center and for their extraordinarily generous ongoing support. Uh, please join me in acknowledging them. The Tanner Center Conference is organized by a distinct team of Utah faculty who develop the theme, invite the speakers, and organize the program. And I want to thank this year's team for their outstanding work. Terry Kogan and Clifford Roski of the College of Law, Lisa Diamond, David Hebner, and Donald Strasberg of the Department of Psychology, and Catherine Stockton of Gender Studies and English. Beyond the core faculty team, a number of departments and centers at the university, as well as local organizations, help make the conference possible through a variety of kinds of support. This year's conference has benefited from sponsors at the B.W. Bastion Foundation, the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences and the College of Humanities, the S.J. Quinney College of Law, the Gender Studies Research Fund, and from co-sponsors at the Shamad Foundation, Departments of Communication, Philosophy, Psychology, and Sociology, the Institute of Public and International Affairs, the Tanner Humanities Center, the University of Utah Office of Diversity, the Salt Lake City Office of Diversity and Human Rights, the Utah Pride Center, and the University of Utah Women's Resource Center. And the conference has also benefited from the participation of several supporting organizations, including the Inclusion Center, the University of Utah LGBT Resource Center, the LGBTQ Affirmative Therapists Guild of Utah, the Salt Lake Rape Recovery Center, and the YWCA. And finally, George Cheney of the Department of Communication has been the director of the Tanner, Center, the Tanner Human Rights Center for the last three years. His tireless efforts in developing and promoting this conference and the other activities of the center have made a great contribution to the life of the university and the broader community. The staff of the center, including Alita Tu and Victoria Medina and Kim Koronek of the Department of Sociology, who's the associate director, uh, also deserve great credit for helping to create this year's conference. Again, please join me in acknowledging the contributions of all of these organizations and individuals. Uh, couple uh, orders of business. Please turn off all uh, cell phones and other noise-making devices. Um, if you parked in a pay lot, parking validation will be available at the museum front desk uh, outside afterward. And uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce Terry Kogan professor of law at the S.J. Quinney College of Law, who will introduce tonight's opening keynote speaker. Thank you.
Thank you, Tom. It is my honor to introduce tonight's keynote speaker, Shannon Price Minter. As one of our country's leading advocates for the legal rights of gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people, Shannon has been one of my true heroes for many years. He serves as legal director of the National Center for Lesbian Rights, one of the nation's leading advocacy organizations for LGBT people. And I want to note that Kate Kendall, the executive director of NCLR, has flown in from San Francisco to be in the audience tonight, and we are thrilled that she has joined us for this Tanner Conference. Back to Shannon. Shannon received his law degree from Cornell Law School in 1993. Among his many accomplishments, Shannon represented the plaintiffs before the California Supreme Court in the landmark marriage equality case in which the court held that same-sex couples have the same fundamental right to marry and that laws that discriminate based on sexual orientation are inherently discriminatory and subject to the highest level of scrutiny. Shannon also argued Strauss versus Horton, the legal challenge to California Supreme, in the California Supreme Court to Proposition 8. In addition, Shannon has served as NCLR's lead attorney on Sharon Smith's groundbreaking wrongful death suit and has litigated many other impact cases in California and across the country. He is the co-author of Transgender Rights, published by the University of Minnesota Press in 2006, and of Family Law for Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender People, published annually by West. He has also authored numerous articles on legal issues affecting LGBT people and has taught at law schools at Stanford, Bolt, Santa Clara, Golden Gate, and the University of San Francisco. Among his many awards and recognitions, in 2009, the California Lawyer named Shannon as California Lawyer of the Year. In addition, in 2004, he was awarded an honorary degree from the City University of New York School of Law for his advocacy on behalf of same-sex couples and their families. So with no further ado, I give you Shannon Price Minter. Oh, thank you, thank you, Professor Kogan, <clears throat> and, and thanks all of you for being here. You know, it is really wonderful for me to be here tonight I've actually really been looking forward to this for many months because this is, for me, kind of a rare opportunity to talk about this topic, you know, same-sex marriage or marriage for same-sex couples and what that means for our nation and for our democracy, but in a setting other than the pressure cooker of a courtroom or a political campaign. For the past six years, as Professor Kogan was noting, you know, I've been involved in efforts to win the freedom to marry for same-sex couples in California. And that was started with the marriage case that resulted in the Supreme Court holding, California Supreme Court, that same-sex couples have a fundamental right to marry, then a very bruising Prop 8 campaign that took that right away. And then in the aftermath, an unsuccessful attempt to challenge Prop 8 as an improper use of the California initiative process, as we argued, a distortion of democracy. And just so no one's confused, there is now another challenge to Prop 8 taking place in federal court on federal grounds. That is the Perry case, and I'm going to be referring to that uh, periodically here. I'm just very grateful to the sponsors and organizers of this conference you know, for giving me and all of us a chance to be in this very different, less pressured, less polarizing venue. And we have what is really the luxury tonight of approaching this topic in what's perhaps a more truly democratic fashion. That is, we have a chance to come together as a community of equals. Everybody's here voluntarily, um, at least I hope so, um, 
and, you know, to draw on the incredible diversity of our experience and our knowledge and just think about this issue together without having a predetermined result or destination based on mutual respect and hopefully a desire to find common ground. You know, I truly want to honor that potential. So rather than engage in a polemic about why same-sex couples should be permitted to marry, I really want to try to offer some thoughts about how we might see this issue or think about this issue in a new light. And I'm hoping that no matter what position you hold uh, currently, that you'll leave here at least with some new thoughts and some new questions, and I expect uh, fully that I will as well. But particularly, I want to challenge the, con the conventional way this debate gets framed, which pits democracy on the one hand against the individual rights of gay people on the other. So what we see very often is those who oppose marriage for same-sex couples invoke democracy to support their position. They point out the majority of people in this country do not wish to permit same-sex couples to marry. They've expressed their wishes through the democratic process by enacting statutes and increasingly over the past few years, constitutional amendments that bar those couples from marriage. Those who hold this view tend to look at court decisions striking down those bans as impermissible departures from the basic principles of democracy or majority rule. In California, for example, the, the official ballot materials supporting Prop 8 really hit this thing very hard. You know, for example, they stated, Californians have never voted for same-sex marriage. If gay activists want to legalize same-sex marriage, they should put it on the ballot. So in contrast, on the other side, people who support marriage for same-sex couples often defend those court decisions by appealing to the importance of individual rights by saying in effect, yes, okay, we live in a democracy of government by majority rule, but democracy has to be tempered by respect for individual rights and the freedom to marry is such a right. And the two recent decisions by the California Supreme Court, you know, the first one upholding the right of same-sex couples to marry, and then the second one upholding Prop 8, which took that right away, uh, also really played into that dualistic framework which posits that there's a competition between democracy and individual rights. And in a way that seemed somewhat arbitrary, in the first successful case, the court held that the individual right trumped democracy. And in the second case, the case we lost, the court held that democracy trumped individual rights. Now I certainly think there is some value and truth to that dualistic framework but I believe ultimately it's just, it's not satisfying. It's not adequate because it fails to capture some really important dimensions of both democracy and marriage. In fact, democracy is more than majority rule and marriage is more than an individual right. So what I'm hoping to do tonight is try and illuminate a little bit those missing dimensions in this debate in order to suggest that rather than being in conflict, the values of democracy of marriage equality, the quest for marriage equality, are actually very intimately intertwined. There's a way to kind of get into that discussion. Uh, I want to share a personal story uh, that, I, that I hope will be helpful and appreciate your indulgence of that. You know, my uh, mother and father both grew up in this very same, in the same very small, very conservative, very rural town of about 300 people in East Texas, which is why I can barely pronounce the word rural, by the way, um, <laughs> between, between Dallas and Shreveport. You know, my parents only had uh, two children, my sister and myself, and both of whom, you know, turned out to be in some form or fashion gay. <clears throat> so my sister, is four years younger, is a lesbian. My situation is a bit more complicated because I'm transgender. I was born female, raised as a girl. I lived much of my adult life identifying uh, as a woman, as a lesbian, and that was before, obviously, I transitioned, went through gender transition from female to male. So, you know, my poor parents, that was their situation. So, <clears throat> you know, like a lot of other families, and uh, like our entire nation, really, for many decades, my family dealt with this by never talking about it. 
You know, our parents were polite, they were cordial to our partners, uh, but they never acknowledged the nature of our relationships, and uh, certainly not to other people. And then when I came out as transgender, my parents uh, cut off all direct contact with me, personal contact, for about seven years. Uh, they no longer wished to see me at that point because due to the physical changes I had undergone, you know, the nature of my identity, it, it just could no longer just be politely ignored. It was obvious, it was visible, and it, it couldn't be hidden from others. So they asked me uh, to stop coming home to visit, and they said if I did come home, they would have to move to another town because they would be uh, so embarrassed. So two things happened uh, to change that you know, pretty painful situation with my family, and both of those relate to marriage. So first, you know, as a transgender man who'd gone through the legal process of a, of a gender transition, I was able to legally marry my female partner, my wife, in 2001, so, so you know, several years ago now. Now my parents would not come to the wedding uh, but my aunt and uncle, who live in that same small town, they did attend. And the impact on them and on me was so uh, really profound. I mean, these are really wonderful, loving people who had, through the years, you know, done their best to be accepting and understanding. But I believe that was the first time that they truly understood and experienced kind of firsthand the reality of my life and my relationship and saw that I had friends and a family and an entire community of support. And there's no doubt in my mind that it was the familiarity of marriage that made that connection possible. They know what marriage means, so they can understand what it meant to me to be married. Now the second thing that happened was the emergence of a very active movement on the part of gay people all across the country to win the freedom to marry. And that sparked a national conversation that eventually spilled over uh, to my family. So my sister, who lives in Oregon, was involved in opposing the 2004 ballot initiative out in Oregon that amended their state constitution to bar same-sex couples from marriage. That was the same year that Utah enacted your much more sweeping constitutional amendment. So my parents happened to be uh, visiting my sister when that initiative was pending. And topic arose, and my father somewhat unthinkingly said, well, I believe marriage is for a man and a woman. My sister became very angry with him, and uh, in an attempt to, you know, explain himself, he said, oh, you know, I'm sorry, I, I just, I've never really thought about it. So at that point, my sister, who had been merely angry, became enraged uh, that my father, you know, who had one child who's transgender and the other child who was lesbian, and yet you know, hadn't given the issue any serious thought. Um, <laughs> so to her, you know, that was, that was more hurtful and wounding. I will say that to his credit, however, my father did then, having been confronted, think about it. That was the start, long and difficult process, and a lot of things happened along the way, but the end result is that when my sister married the woman who is now her wife in Whistler, Canada, uh, my parents and a bunch of my relatives, uh, Whistler might never be the same, um, were not only present, but my parents were the official witnesses uh, to, their, to their wedding and signed, signed the official witness form. And then uh, before my father um, passed away from cancer uh, this past July, you know, I spent a month with him and my mother in that same small town. You know, for the first time, uh, my father introduced me as his son without any hesitation and also very warmly and sincerely uh, introduced my wife uh, to our family and neighbors and community members. Now, I share that story because especially as I get older and realize the difficulty of questioning the most basic assumptions about how I have structured my life, I am very moved and inspired by my father's courage and being willing to take that leap into the unknown, to examine a belief that he had held all his life, the marriage is for a man and a woman, and held so deeply that he'd not even recognized it as something possibly subject to question. And he did that out of love, you know, in order to maintain a relationship with his children. I also share that story because it shows the power of marriage to create bonds of understanding and acceptance, you know, a common framework.
And I also share that story because it shows likewise the power of marriage to break through the silence and evasions about the place of gay people in our democracy. I think perhaps more than any other issue relating to LGBT people, marriage somehow caused the question so directly of whether gay people are entitled to be treated as fully equal, respected, and participating members of society. I'll say a little more in a minute about why I think that might be. But I think those experiences uh, with my family in Texas are just a microcosm of what's happening across the entire country. And that's both inside the LGBT community and also in the broader culture. You know, just as my sister and I had the experience in the last 10 years of doing something, I can guarantee you neither of us ever in our wildest imagination dreamed we would be able to do, which is to marry the person we love now tens of thousands of same-sex couples in this country and hundreds of thousands, maybe more, across the globe have had that same experience. So that means that for the first time in our history, for every single LGBT person in this country and every single LGBT youth, marriage is no longer cruelly and categorically out of reach. It is, instead, it's a real possibility. It's a realistic option. Just like other people, LGBT people increasingly have the freedom to marry or not to marry. Just as important, everyone now knows that. It's no longer possible to say, as many courts have said, public officials, many others, that so-called same-sex marriage is an impossibility. Same-sex couples can now marry in five states, D.C. is soon going to be added to that list, and nearly a dozen countries or jurisdictions internationally. So, you know, that is a genuinely, deeply new phenomenon. It's just a new psychological, social, and psychological experience for the LGBT community. I really believe we're just beginning to grasp its significance, you know, what that is going to mean. On a political level, you know, it means that marriage equality is now an important goal of the gay rights movement. It means that marriage is widely, although by no means universally, a uh, shared aspiration among many LGBT people in the country. But what those external developments represent or signify, I think, is just a much more profound revolution in the internal psychology and social status of LGBT people. You know, in a society in which the right to marry is a fundamental freedom and a prerequisite of equal citizenship, being excluded from that freedom has had very serious negative and psychological and social consequences for our community. In the recent uh, federal court challenge that's now ongoing to Proposition 8, you know, one of the most moving pieces of testimony was by, uh, from Kristen Perry. She's a plaintiff in the case. And she talked about growing up as a lesbian in Bakersfield, California, which I think is not that different from Texas or Utah. You know, on, on direct examination, uh, Ms. Perry was asked, and uh, the attorney asking was none other than Ted Olson, who's the former U.S. Solicitor General under George W. Bush, and who's actually representing the plaintiffs in the case. So he was conducting this examination. Mr. Olson said, what does the institution of marriage mean to you? Why do you want that? So she answered, well, I've never really let myself want it until now. Growing up as a lesbian, you don't let yourself want it because everyone tells you you're never going to have it. So in some ways, it's hard for me to grasp what it would even mean. But I do see other people who are married, what it looks like is that you're honored and respected by your family. And when you leave your home and you go to work or you go out to the world, people know what the relationship means. And so then everyone can, in a sense, join in supporting your relationship, which at this point I can only observe as an outsider. I don't have any firsthand experience with what that must be like. Now, it was obviously difficult for Kristen Perry to give that testimony in open court. She was visibly pained. It was difficult to hear. It is painful to want something you know you can't have. It's even more mortifying to have that hopeless desire exposed to scrutiny by others. 
think that phenomenon, you know, the humiliation of wanting what's available to others but is denied to you because of who you are, and the damage that does to the human spirit, you know, that's been experienced, of course, by many other marginalized groups in this country. It is, in a way, the very essence of the damage done by discrimination. One of the distinct harms of anti-gay discrimination is that it often comes, the source of it is often in the first instance coming from one's parents or families. And so that means that one of the shelters, one of the most important shelters that young people sometimes have, often have, to help protect them from other types of discrimination is just not available to LGBT youth. So later in her testimony, Kristen Perry said, I believe for me, personally as a lesbian, that if I had grown up in a world where the most important decision I was going to make as an adult, she means the decision about whether to marry and who to marry, was treated the same way as everybody else's decision, I wouldn't have been treated the way I was growing up or as an adult. There's something so humiliating about everybody knowing that you want to make that decision and you don't get to. It's hard to face the people at work and the people even here right now. So if Prop 8 were undone and kids like me growing up in Bakersfield right now could never know what this felt like, I assume their entire lives would be on a higher arc. They would live with a higher sense of themselves who would improve the quality of their entire life. In fact, one of the most serious types of damage inflicted by marriage bans is the public message, the official government message they send to LGBT youth gay relationships are not valued or respected, they're of secondary value, if any value at all, they're certainly not equal and never will be to those of heterosexual relationships. And there is a direct correlation between that official message of rejection and the elevated rate of suicide attempts and suicide, suicide among LGBT youth, which is three to five times higher than that of other youth. There's additional damage caused by the burden and stress associated with just social invisibility, social illegibility. It is exhausting and demeaning, especially for young people, to have no established social place. Marriage bans that don't just exclude LGBT people from marriage, they exclude them from an entire universe of shared language and meaning push them into a kind of limbo or no man's land where you either have to struggle to conceal the nature of one's relationship or constantly struggle to explain it. And Kristen Perry also testified about that experience. She said, I don't have access to the words that describe my relationship right now. I'm a 45 year old woman. I've been in love with the woman for 10 years and I don't have a word to tell anybody that I don't have a word. Now, Helen Zia, who is a lesbian author and a journalist, she also testified about this phenomenon. And it was really interesting because she testified about the difference in her experience before and after she married uh, Leah, who is now her wife. So she said, this is the before. You know, Leah and I spend a lot of time with each other. We go to social engagements with each other. We go to work engagements. And people say, well, who's this person who seems to be hanging on to you awfully close? And if I say, oh, she's my partner, I can't count the number of times people say, oh, partner, partner in what business? And Leah and I got used to having an answer to that and say, well, we're partners in life. And then we just get used to watching the look on their faces to see whether they got it. And often it would just be this look of bewilderment. Oh, what business is life? Do you mean life insurance? <laughs> and then, uh, and I just, this testimony to me was so powerful. Then Helen talked about the, what changed after they were married. She says, for me to show up at every family event in Leah's family, people ask, well, who's she? You know, who's this? And for her parents or for her 94-year-old auntie to say, well, this is Helen's friend. Well, she must be a really good friend because she's been coming to these events for the last 17 years. <laughs> but, but friend didn't quite capture it. Partner. They never got, they never said, oh, Helen is Leah's partner. And suddenly they were able to say, Helen is my daughter-in-law. My mother is an immigrant from China. English is her second language. She really doesn't get what partner is. I would be around her and her friends who would look at Leah and I could hear them say, sometimes in English and sometimes in Chinese, who's she? 
you know, my mother before we would marry would struggle and just say, uh, she's Helen's friend. And then it changed. And she would say, this is my daughter-in-law. And they would get it. And whether they approved or disapproved, it didn't matter. They got it. It's like you don't insult somebody's wife. You don't insult somebody's mother. She's clearly saying, this is my wife. That's it. End of story. There's no questions. Wife in what? Spouses in what? We're not partners in life or in some business. And so it changed things on a huge level. You know, I, uh, re I also remember the first time I brought Robin, who is now my wife, you know, home to me, my family, home to Texas. I had just begun transitioning, so we appeared to be sort of um, a, a same-sex couple, um, a lesbian couple. It was the last time I visited before my parents asked me not to come back. I was introducing Robin to one of my aunts, and I said, this is my partner, Robin. And my aunt said, oh, are you in business together? You know, I can still picture just so vividly, you know, sitting there on my grandmother's, you know, green vinyl couch with that awful but wonderful painting of wild stallions hanging over it. I bet you I am not the only person in this room who knows that wild stallion painting, because that, that thing has been around. <laughs> um, and just, you know, so I was surrounded by people I'd grown up with and I loved so much. And I just wanted nothing more than to be able to share my happiness and excitement at having met the person you know, who I really thought might be the one. You know, I can still picture, too, that just the panic on my mother's face and my aunt's question and my mother's absolute determination to jump in and divert the conversation, which she's a master at, and she did. Um, and then, you know, for the next seven years, uh, I could not go back home. I was asked not to go back home. Also, I miss my... I uh, didn't see my, my little cousins grow up, miss my grandmother's funeral, miss my cousin's weddings, uh, miss my Uncle J Jack's funeral, then my Uncle Bobby's, my Uncle Price's, that was the uncle who came to my wedding. I missed having a relationship with my cousin Adam, uh, who shot himself uh, at the age of 21 in the woods behind my grandmother's house because he couldn't face his father's rejection of him for being gay. And I missed uh, any chance I might have had to make a difference with Adam. And I missed, you know, precious time with my parents and my father that I will never get back. But I would venture to guess that for every single lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender person in this room tonight, there are, these are situations that you also likely, at least to some degree, have faced at some time. I know the dilemma of whether to hide your identity or explain it, the absence of language, those awkward pauses when acquaintances or coworkers begin to talk about their spouses and children, and just the relentless erasure of your identity and your relationship, and the exhausting pretense to others, or perhaps even to yourself, that it doesn't matter, you're fine, it's not so bad, you don't really want those things anyway. Acceptance, respect, inclusion, the ability to marry. Who needs them? You know, I told myself those things for years and was so defended against the humiliation and pain of uh, possibly wanting those things when they were so clearly out of reach uh, that I barely let myself want anything at all. And that is the boundary, the psychological boundary that LGBT people have had to overcome, get over, in order to open themselves up to the painful emotional risks of seeking, asking for recognition for our relationships and our families, knowing that the door may be slammed in our faces, as it was in California, with the enactment of Prop 8, and as it has been repeatedly here in Utah with the enactment of multiple measures seeking to strip LGBT people of recognition as parents, as partners, as human beings. I just want to take one moment here to say that I am in awe of Equality Utah and the larger LGBT and allied community here who just have withstood those assaults, responded with resilience, creativity, just remarkable willingness to continue to reach out to the very people who are harming them and I know there are very deep lessons in what's been going on here for the rest of the country and for our movement. And uh, I, I believe that uh, 
the utterly brilliant uh, Professor Lisa Dugan and her remarks tomorrow is going to at least to some extent address some of those developments. Uh, so tonight, um, what I'm hoping is that our discussion can show that to think of marriage merely as an individual right is really to miss one of the most essential dimensions of what's at stake in the effort to win marriage equality, what I've been trying to describe. You know, when you think, when we think about individual rights, we tend to think of claims, naturally, that pit the individual against society. You know, the right to dissent, the right to be different, the right to be outside of social norms. And historically, that is absolutely very much the way that our society and the law have thought about and characterized gay people. You know, in the Perry trial, um, Dr. Elon Meyer testified. He's a social psychologist and he testified as an expert for uh, the same-sex couples in the, the, again in the federal challenge in Perry. And he explained that there's pervasive stereotype that gay people are incapable of intimate relationships, they may be undesiring even of intimate relationships, and certainly they're not successful at having intimate relationships. And instead, gay people have been described for many years and they're seen by others as social isolates, as unconnected, and in that sense as not good citizens who participate in society the same way that other people do. I think one of the most pernicious stereotypes about lesbians and gay men, and bisexual and transgender people, is that they're incapable of forming lasting commitments or having true, genuine family bonds, and that instead they're motivated by selfishness, adult sexual desires by sex. Uh, as one legal scholar has noted, the fact that in most places, almost everywhere uh, in this country, the law tells everybody that lesbians and gay men are lone individuals despite the fact that they have families. That story is both false and stigmatizing. And as lesbian sociologist Kath, Kath Weston has pointed out, it's a short step from positioning lesbians and gay men as somewhere beyond the family or outside the family, allegedly unencumbered by relations of kinship, responsibility, or affection, to portraying them as a menace to family and society. That's exactly what the Prop 8 campaign in California did. So you can see then, that just you can see how this all falls out, that almost by definition, gay rights, gay rights have been seen as antithetical to society and to the family. In fact, for many, conservative scholars, gay rights are just synonymous. There could be no other kind of gay right than an individual right. And those scholars actually see uh, the efforts of same-sex couples to win recognition for their relationships as the epitome of a dangerous breakdown of the family and of social relationships. I just want to read you a little bit from a very recent law review article. It was written in 2005. And this is utterly typical of much of the scholarship uh, that takes this view. Quote, in a society of broken families, individual rights trump family rights, and the family is undermined. That is how we have come to see the rise of homosexual rights and a myriad of bizarre special interests that were once unimaginable in a normal society. So in light of the pervasiveness of those stereotypes of gay people as outside the family, outside society, outside social relationships, it should be apparent why seeking the right to marry you know, carries such a powerful charge and at the same time has the potential to bring about a really significant change in the way that society views gay people. When, when LGBT people claim the right to marry, you know, we are confronting those stereotypes in the most direct way imaginable. By seeking the right to marry, gay people are claiming, demonstrating, their ability and desire to be in a family relationship, you know, to join in an institution whose whole purpose is to create reciprocal obligations, sort of integrate an individual into this whole network of social relations. Now, I realize that uh, for uh, you know most of the heterosexual people in the room tonight, it may be that these very alienating experiences that were described by Kristen Perry and Helen Zia and that I've been describing in my own family, you know, may be a bit hard to imagine. And I do not think for a moment that that is because people lack empathy or caring, but it is just simply, and we should acknowledge this, it is difficult 
for those who've always enjoyed a rider privilege and been able to take it for granted, it's just difficult to imagine what it would be to be without the, that rider privilege. And we certainly see this in other contexts. You know, uh, people who are white, for people who are white, it takes significant effort to become even partially aware of the enormous privilege that comes with that status in every aspect of life, you know, applying for a job, renting an apartment, walking into a store. You can imagine, you know, the difference, the very different reception that one is likely to get if you're Audrey Hepburn or Lindsay Lohan, you know, window shopping in Beverly Hills compared to the likely response to a young black man engaging in that very same behavior. You know, what's going to be seen on the one hand is just the epitome of innocence is very likely to be seen uh, in the other context of a young black man as a potential criminality. In the same way, you know, for people who are male, as someone who's had the experience of living first as a woman, then as a man, um, I feel like I can speak with some authority on this one. Um, <laughs> you know, it's just it's very easy to take for granted just the unearned privileges that come with masculinity. Uh, I've actually been kind of appalled in my own case about how quickly that happens, so that I actually have difficulty remembering, you know, what it, what it was like before. So that, that's the same is just naturally going to be true of privilege based on sexual orientation. And the California Supreme Court noted this in the decision in the marriage case. They said that even the most familiar and generally accepted social practices and traditions often mask an unfairness and inequality that frequently is not recognized or appreciated by those who are not directly harmed. So the remarkable thing is not that most heterosexual people don't automatically understand the harm that's inflicted by marriage bans. Actually, the remarkable thing is that so many heterosexual people, you know, like my father and others, are in fact willing to make that effort when given the chance, you know, when confronted or when asked to do so. So the more the LGBT people are willing to do that most painful and awkward and uncomfortable and sometimes humiliating thing, which is to talk about what it feels like to be excluded and the impact that has on our lives and our children and our families. You know, the more that straight people not only will listen, but will begin to understand and empathize. You know, certainly there are individuals and groups who deliberately foment anti-gay prejudice and deliberately exploit vicious stereotypes and lies about LGBT people. I believe that was true of many of the leaders and the architects of the Yes on 8 campaign in California. I mean, that w it was based on fear mongering and it drew the messages and the imagery drew in this very calculating way on a history of campaigns to demonize gay people as dangerous threats to children and families. And that is actually one of the issues in the Perry litigation is whether Prop 8, and the judge will decide this, whether Prop 8 was rooted in anti-gay animus. But I also believe that most people do not intentionally want to embrace anti-gay prejudice and wouldn't support marriage bans if they recognized the harms that those bans caused to real people and real families. There was a, a really poignant illustration of that in California in 2007. That's when the marriage case was still pending. Uh, the San Diego City Council had passed a resolution, and San Diego's a pretty conservative city, uh, so this was significant, had passed a resolution authorizing the city to file a brief supporting the same-sex couples in the marriage case. So the San Diego mayor was a staunch Republican named Jerry Saunders. He had publicly announced that he was going to veto that resolution. Instead, very unexpectedly, the next day, he held this wrenching emotional press conference in which he, he cried. Uh, this guy is like former military chief of police, like a really tough guy. It was kind of shocking to see him cry. He talked about his lesbian daughter and explained that uh, despite a very serious threat uh, of backlash from, from his political party who threatened to pull their support for him in, in, the, in his election uh, campaign, that he was going to, he would not veto that resolution. So he has since explained what was going on. I mean, he's explained that when that resolution crossed his desk, he absolutely sincerely believed that civil unions or some alternative status was adequate, that was fair. He thought he would be doing the right thing by vetoing that resolution. That's what he planned to do. And then the night before, he was going to 
hold a press conference announcing that the next day he just invited some lesbian and gay neighbors and friends to his home because he said he thought he should just give them the courtesy of letting them know what was going to happen the next day. And then what, what happened next reminds me very much of my sister's, you know, kind of fateful conversation with my father back in Oregon when she was so hurt and he was so surprised by that. So, you know, perhaps naively, uh, Mayor Sanders, he really expected that those lesbian and gay neighbors and acquaintances uh, would understand his position, but they did not. And instead, in his words, he said, I was absolutely shocked at the depth of the hurt, the depth of the feeling. You know, one of our neighbors, who I've known for quite some time, said, my partner and I walk by here all the time with our children, and you always stop and say hello to them. And you know, we're a family just like you're a family. One of our other neighbors said she had children just like I did, and they felt their children also deserved to have parents who were married. The depth of the feeling was unbelievable, the depth of the hurt and I could see the harm that I had done by considering the veto. So Mayor Sanders described that meeting, and he testified about this in the Perry trial as well, as a defining moment. He explained that he was really shook up by this realization that his prior positions uh, inadvertently had been hurting people and had been, as he said, grounded in prejudice. I hadn't understood the issue clearly enough, and I was discriminating even against my own daughter by saying that her relationship was less than the relationship in marriage my wife and I had. So that process of realization, that kind of dawning you know, recognition that you're hurting people that Mayor Sanders described is the same one I've seen unfold in my own family and it's the same one happening across the country. It is just simply kind of awakening to the full humanity of gay people. We've seen that process unfold in some very unexpected places, you know, with Iowa, where the Iowa Supreme Court was the first court in the country to unanimously hold that same-sex couples have a right to marry. We've seen it embraced by some very unexpected people, um, Ted Olson, who I mentioned earlier, and Dick Cheney, you know, two of the most iconic figures of the conservative moment, movement. And then former President Clinton, who when he was in office signed the Federal Defense of Marriage Act recent interview, President Clinton said he changed his mind. Uh, referring to marriage by same-sex couples, he said, I think it's a good thing, not a bad thing. And I just realized, maybe because of my age and the way I've grown up, I was wrong about that. I just had too many gay friends. I saw their relationships. I just decided I couldn't. I had an untenable position. Not surprisingly, the most reliable allies that LGBT people have had in this struggle have been the leaders of other civil rights movement who've just been at the forefront of supporting marriage equality. And that includes Julian Bond, you know, the outgoing chairman of the NAACP, Tom Sines, president of the Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund, Dolores Huerta of the United Farm Workers, leaders of many national women's organizations, and literally just scores and scores of civil rights organizations that have joined briefs supporting the freedom to marry in California and other cases, and it came out even more heavily in opposition to uh, Prop 8. But one of the most powerful statements of support uh, came from Mildred Loving, who was one of the plaintiffs in uh, Loving versus Virginia, which was the 1967 case in which the U.S. Supreme Court struck down laws barring interracial marriage. And for people who don't know the details of the case, uh, you know, Mildred and Richard, they grew up together. They were childhood sweethearts. They fell in love. Uh, they wanted to marry. They had to leave Virginia, where, where they'd grown up, and cross the border over into D.C. to get married. They lived in D.C. for a while, but wanted to move back to Virginia to be near their families. And when they did, they were arrested literally in the middle of the night in their own home and jailed. So Richard Loving, uh, the other plaintiff in that case, he died many years ago. And uh, Mrs. Loving uh, has been a, an extremely private person. I mean, she's had so many requests uh, to be interviewed, to make appearances, uh, to be honored, but, and she never would do any of it. But, you know, the 40th anniversary of Loving versus Virginia was, was getting near in 2007, and she was approached and asked if she would voice support for the freedom of same-sex couples to marry. She did not say, she did not immediately say yes. You know, she thought about it for a few days, 
and uh, and eventually she did agree to uh, to put out a statement, and you know. People who were talking to her asked her, you know, they wanted, they said, are you sure you understand? You know, you are putting your name behind the idea that two men or two women should have the right to marry each other. And she said, yes, I understand that and I believe that. Now, she passed away very shortly after that, but she, she left this powerful statement behind. And she said, surrounded as I am now by wonderful children and grandchildren, not a, get, not a day goes by that I don't think of Richard and our love, our right to marry, and how much it meant to me to have that freedom to marry the person precious to me, even if others thought he was the wrong kind of person for me to marry. I believe all Americans, no matter their race, no matter their sex, no matter their sexual orientation, should have that same freedom to marry. I think it's just incredible that after 40 years of living essentially as a recluse at a point when she was terribly frail and ill, that Mil Mildred Loving would have made that effort to publicly speak out and align herself, uh, knowing what that would mean, with the community that is still marginalized and even despised uh, by so many people. But I believe that what uh, Mrs. Loving's statement shows is that you know, despite the very real differences between the histories and struggles of different marginalized groups in this country, and they're very significant, those differences. But there is a powerful principle of democratic equality that, that unites those struggles. And I think it's important to consider the movement for marriage equality in that context and in that light, not as the assertion of an individual right, or for that matter, as a capitulation to some sort of craven assimilationism, but as a very robust demand for democratic inclusion. The same way that many other groups are similar, the way that many other groups have done, you know, by asserting the right to equal protection in legislatures and courts, LGBT people are calling on the country to live up to its democratic ideals. And even when we lose, and right now we mostly do lose, we are realigning both our own sense of identity in the nation sense, the public sense of who we are. And that very act of claiming the freedom to marry, we're asserting our right to belong, to be insiders, and by exposing the gap between the promise of equality and the reality of exclusion, you know, we're making that gap visible to other people as well. And that's really, that is the collective version of the conversation my sister has with my father and that Mayor Sanders had with his neighbors and colleagues. That's what these court cases and legislative efforts do collectively. And that is the very essence of democracy. You know, that process, that constant process of making the gap between the ideals, the principles of equality, and our failure ever to fully realize that visible. As the Supreme Court said in Lawrence v. Texas, you know, times can blind us to certain truths, and later generations can see that laws once thought necessary and proper in fact, serve only to oppress. As, uh, what the court is recognizing there is very important, which is that democratic equality is an aspiration by definition. It is never an achieved fact. You know, equality is not an either or situation. It is a process. In fact, that's similar to a marriage, not unlike a marriage. A democracy can exist only as long as there's an ongoing commitment on the part of those who comprise it to be a union of democratic equals, to be a people at demos. So almost by definition, if you have a majority that decides to permanently exclude a disfavored group from equal treatment, then the very basis of democracy, that union of democratic equals, no longer exists. And at bottom, that is the core issue, the core legal and constitutional issue that's presented by Proposition 8. You know, can a majority create what the California Supreme Court called an exception to equal protection? That's what the court held that Prop 8 does, it creates an exception to equal protection. Or does that, does a measure that intentionally does that violate the most basic premise of, of a democracy? So in the first California marriage case, the one we won, the California Supreme Court rec linked family recognition and equal citizenship. And, you know, the court said that you know, given the social importance of marriage and the long history of discrimination against gay people, 
the court recognized there's just no way that excluding gay people from marriage would not be stigmatizing, and the court said it was a mark of second-class citizenship. The court recognized that because the social and the legal status of gay people are necessarily intertwined, that if you exclude gay couples from marriage, it's going to prevent them from being able to participate fully in the broader society, even in the political process as citizens. Then in the challenge to Prop 8, the court just dramatically backpedaled from that recognition. In the Prop 8 case, we're back to individual rights. The court was unable to see equality as anything more than just an individual right. It was unable to apply its prior recognition that there is a direct link between family recognition and equal citizenship. So the court did what should be unthinkable in a democracy which is to say the majority can create an exception to the principle of equal protection. So I think we must understand is that when courts enforce equality, constitutional equality norms in these marriage cases, and when we advocate for marriage equality in the legislative arena, this is not about enforcing individual rights. It's about ensuring that a truly democratic diversity of families can exist and be protected and that the government can't use the law to stigmatize same-sex couples or any other class of citizens and relegate them to a permanent second-class status. You know, that's not democracy. So Cornell West uh, recently observed that every democracy, every democracy has been predicated on what he calls anti-democratic realities. You know, in this country, our founding as a democracy was based on, in his words, indigenous people's land and bodies and the enslavement of African-American peoples. But what that means, he's suggesting, is that there's always a choice. You're either going to expand your democracy and deal with those anti-democratic realities or you will lose it. Every democracy is fragile, contingent. Every generation has to revitalize and regenerate the best of what has been bequeathed to them. So in that light, the LGBT movement's struggle for marriage is not a defiance of democracy, as many people have, have suggested, but it's really a profound affirmation of faith in democracy and it's in the deepest sense of that word. Gay people are seeking the freedom to marry because that freedom, and not marriage, but the freedom to choose whether and whom to marry is essential to the principle of equal citizenship that's at the very heart of our democracy. I'm going to stop there and look forward to questions, comments, maybe challenges. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate you being here, and thank you for saying that. Um, this working. Um, I my name is Bonnie, and um, I am a queer activist in Salt Lake who advocates against marriage. And so I'm wondering, you mentioned a lot of um, benefits of marriage, and I'm wondering if you feel there are any um, disadvantages or harms. Um, within the marriage movement and within the institution of marriage? Okay. Yeah, I know that's a very, uh, very good question. Um, and there's only ever so much you can take on in one talk. So <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you raised that question because I think it's extremely important. 
uh, I think we have to be very careful when we are advocating for marriage equality for same-sex couples not to just reinstate uh, a whole new set of exclusions that are going to marginalize and stigmatize uh, other people, people who are not married or don't wish to marry. And I think that's very challenging. I think that the question of whether pushing for marriage equality uh, is going to have a progressive effect or a reactionary effect is not one that can be answered ahead of time. I think it depends in large part on us and how we understand our ultimate goals and you know what what we decide to do as a community and an alliance with the larger community politically. Uh, yeah, I think it's very tricky. Um, one one analogy that I found really helpful in thinking about that question is uh, you know uh, Judith Butler has uh, an, an analysis in um, her book called um, I think it's called I Sing the Nation State. Uh, where she talks about it. back in 2006, if people remember, I, you know, those of us who are from California certainly remember, you know, there were these just amazing uh, demonstrations of immigrants, particularly in, in Los Angeles. And one of the things that happened was uh, people sang the national anthem in Spanish. And it created this ridiculous uproar uh, where I mean, the most absurd statements uh, were made by you know, President Bush objected to the singing of the national anthem in Spanish. People talked about outlawing the singing of the national anthem in Spanish. And uh, you know what, what uh, Judith Butler uh, points out is obviously that, is, that act was an, uh, uh, an appropriation of uh, an assertion of belonging, uh, an appropriation of a certain kind of uh, patriotism. And she makes the point that you, know, you can, you can Try and outlaw it all you want, but it happened. I mean, just you know, you you cannot you can't change that. There's no changing the fact retroactively that hey, you know what, the national anthem can be sung in Spanish, and I think there you know there's something similar here going on with with very similar actually with marriage, where you know now you have same-sex couples claiming the right to marriage, claiming the right to participate uh, in this institution, and what is the response? All these states pass laws barring. Uh, so-called same-sex marriage, but you know you can bar it all you want. But guess what? You know it exists, and you uh, same-sex couples have shown that you know marriage can sort of be sung and queer, <laughs> you know, like it or not. That's uh, that that can happen. And uh, the other thing that the Butler points out that I think is really significant here, she said, uh, even that there was a you know a uh, part of what was sung is uh, my sorry my. Spanish is horrible. It's so almost equalis. You know, we're we're equal. Again, a claim to equality. But even to understand that claim, you have to translate it. So obviously, it is it is a claim not simply to be uh, accepted as exactly the same. You know, to to assimilate into this pre-existing institution without in any way changing it. I, I think it's something very similar. Uh, could be said about the effort to win same-sex marriage for couples. You know, it's for marriage for same-sex couples. Um, you know, it has to be translated into a different key. It is something different. The point is not to be the same as everyone else. And in fact, uh, you know, if you're going to step back and look at this from a democratic theory point of view, the very premise, uh, part of the reason that democracy is valued and that it's, uh, you know, believed to be a desirable form of collective uh, self-governance is that it's a way to draw upon the strength of diversity, of diverse life experiences, knowledges, perspectives, beliefs, values. So I think there's a very potentially very, um, very progressive link there that could be made between the recognition of family, diversity, and a, and a substantively meaningful uh, democracy, which not, is, isn't exactly an oversupply at the moment, but anyway, not to not to belabor this too long. But but you know, Butler also makes the point that hey, you know, this could just uh, collapse right back into something quite conservative. Talking about the singing of the national anthem in Spanish, that could absolutely happen as well with the effort to win marriage equality for same-sex couples. I think it depends very much, if not entirely, on what we understand ourselves to be doing.
I, some people want to strip marriage of its protected constitutional status. Right now, marriage, besides parentage, marriage is the only family relationship that is constitutionally entitled to affirmative state recognition and protection. So there's some progressive people who say, let's get rid of that. That's ridiculous. That shouldn't be. It should all just be policy. You know, we should just figure out in some kind of rational way what kind of benefits should go to what family configurations and so forth. I do not agree with that. I, I am afraid of that. I think because if we want to see what happens to people who don't have that affirmative constitutional protection, uh, look around. That's exactly what happens to gay people, to single mothers, to unmarried couples. It is not pretty. I think there is an enormous value in having the shelter of that concept that your family should be constitutionally protected. And what I would like to see us do is expand the kinds of families that are entitled to affirmative constitutional protection and recognition. And I think that seeking the freedom to marry for same-sex couples, if we do it the right way, can really lay the foundation for that and open the door to that. But it's not a foregone conclusion by a long shot. Um, so as a queer person of color, um, I hear about the m movement towards um, equality and one whatnot, and I was wondering what are your thoughts on that kind of, I feel like I hear marriage equality in this movement, but I feel like I'm at the very back as a queer person of color, um, and I see it almost kind of like that movement trying to get the rights as the heterosexual and the queer people of color kind of left behind. That's just how I see it. So what are your thoughts? And movement forward. Thank you. Well, you know, the LGBT movement uh, does not have a very good record on uh, being inclusive of LGBT people of color or dealing with issues of racial justice. I mean, as a transgender person, I have been so struck by the fact that, um, I mean, if you just you go back to the mid-90s, uh, most of the mainstream gay organizations didn't want anything to do with transgender people, didn't want to deal with transgender issues, and, you know, we made a big fuss and changed that in an amazingly short amount of time. Ten years later, it was not perfect, but pretty much all of the national gay organizations had included transgender people in issues in their mission statements and to some degree on their staff. So it's not perfect, but it's pretty good. Uh, I think in contrast, people of color, LGBT people of color, have been raising an analogous exclusion of racial justice issues and LGBT people of color for even longer, and yet there's nothing like comparable progress. I mean, that, that's, that is a shameful fact. It is probably the most damning aspect or characteristic of the LGBT movement. And, you know, I'm embarrassed to stand up here and say, you know, we need to do something about it. I mean, it's so far past the time and the point to, to just be making statements about that. I mean, it, it, I think it is, it is a, it's actually a crisis in our movement and something that we have got to get serious uh, about addressing. You know, it has negative, all kinds of negative ramifications, but one of them is that even though there are, I think, very significant and legitimate connections and analogies qualified to be made between the LGBT movements and other civil rights movements, we are not in a very good position to make them because of our history um, on not dealing with issues of racial justice. And you know, we're, we pay the price. If anyone else wants to comment on any of these questions, well, too, I hope they will. You know, there is a lovely reception. Um, thanks to the Tanner family and the Tanner Center after this, at which you can talk to Shannon uh, and ask some questions. Um, OK, hey, Shannon. Catherine hey. Stockton here. Um, so it seems to me, I mean, you, you've spoken very movingly for me in this talk about 
remembering what it was like growing up, not imagining that there was any relationship that I was going to be in. First of all, that I would ever let out of the bag, um, that I would ever tell my parents about, and that would ever be approved of in any kind of way. So I think you tap a very sort of deep place in, in somebody like me in speaking to that. I, like Bonnie, um, not a fan of marriage, and I'm looking forward to the day in which I have the right to marry so I can reject marriage firmly. <laughs> and so, very good, very so good. So that the legibility of my choice, having yeah. been with my partner for 20 years, um, not wanting any part of marriage for a whole series of reasons, because the history of marriage, because of its exclusions, uh, because of the ra racialization of it, so many different things one could say as a feminist. Um, and yet I really have no public way um, to sort of state that. I think people just sort of assume that I'm itching to get married, and when I finally have the right, and because I've been with my partner so long, I'm going to be running down there to the courthouse. And I think implicit in what you said tonight is this question of choosing and legibility. Um, so I really deeply appreciate that as somebody who actually loves weddings but dislikes marriage. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I've loved all of my friends who have been married and things I've participated in. So I guess my only question is, with the way that this has to be argued, which I completely understand, this sort of emotional appeal about the damage done to people when marriage is not available to them. And I, again, could speak to that in myself, but I wonder whether that emotional argument then does sort of create a sort of sense, sort of like Bonnie's saying, this sort of unquestioned good of marriage, and therefore then it makes my right to speak against marriage once again illegible because now I seem to be without an emotional argument, without sort of stepping on other people's beauty of their relationship and they want to be married and I, you know, I'm fine with that, I support that, but just not for myself. So maybe if you could talk a little bit about the kind of argument that has to be made with the emotional appeal and whether you have any qualms about that. I mean, you may not, you've spoken so strongly to it in, in terms that really speak to me as well. So. Thank you. Oh my God, that comment was so eloquent. And I thought I was going to escape a question. I thought, oh great. <laughs> I was like, good. Yeah, what well, you said, that was perfect. Because um, <laughs> it is true. I mean, that's one of the just ironies of this whole situation is that right now, LGBT people cannot actually meaningfully voice, or make the choice not to marry because it's been taken away from us. I mean, that's that just kind of a crazy irony. Um, no, again, I think that's an extremely important uh, question. Um, what I want to do, and this, you know, is part of a much larger project. I think, um, for example, in the California marriage case, part of what happened in that case has just never happened in any other marriage litigation. It didn't happen in any of the U.S. Supreme Court marriage cases because there's just never really been occasion for it. Um, no court before had ever explained why is marriage protected as a fundamental right. I mean, there are little snippets of statements here and there, but there was never any kind of coherent explanation of, well, why is it a fundamental right? And so the California Supreme Court, they actually um, ask us for supplemental briefing at a point where we thought we were all done with the briefing with that case, and they issued this order as for, and said, hey, could you brief these additional questions? And one of them was, Basically, what the hell is the fundamental right to marry, and where does it come from, and why does it exist? And I mean, that was that was a very difficult question to answer. But the courts, uh, the court, it, that, I, this is the, my favorite thing about that decision is that the court lays out in great depth, and I think in a very coherent, compelling way, why there should be a fundamental right to marry. And they talk about things like. Um, that the state has to give people a way to knit their lives together. The state has to create kind of almost like a boundary so that uh, to protect people against inter, you know, invasion of your relationship in a, by the government and by third parties. Um, just this is a very human thing that if we want people want to form these family relationships, then the government has to facilitate that or, because otherwise you are just completely vulnerable to any and all kinds of arbitrary and discriminatory treatment and intervention by the government, by third parties, and so forth. I mean, that's, uh, that's pretty compelling. And the, the value of having forced a court to articulate what underlies the fundamental right to marry is that you can then come back and say, well, you know what, there's some other relationships that based on those very same rationales should also 
be entitled to constitutional protection. So I really do. I mean, this is a little bit of a maybe too nerdy doctrinal analysis, but just from a doctrinal point of view, I think it really potentially gives us some very powerful tools to expand protection for a whole range of other possible family types like, you know, so-called fictive kinship relationships, just care, other caretaking relationships. So that could be really powerful. But we have to be really careful about the way we argue this stuff. And I mean, just like, for example, we are super careful about what we say about parenting and children because, you know, one of the most important principles for NCLR as an organization and uh, and that's been – that. And child welfare advocates, you know, took decades to establish this from the U.S. Supreme Court, is that children are entitled to equal protection regardless of whether their parents are married, and they sh that should be true socially, legally, constitutionally. It should not matter one bit whether your parents are married, uh, from a child's point of view. And so we have been really careful not to make arguments that oh, well, children are hurt by having unmarried parents. And I do realize that one of the quotes that I used uh, from the Mayor Sanders meeting kind of skirted the line on that and it made me a little bit uncomfortable. Um, it's just really difficult to make that fine distinction between, yeah, it hurts children and families to stigmatize an entire class of people. And it's the stigma and the inequality that is relevant there. Uh, it's not the being, it's not the unmarried parent per se aspect of it, but that's, you know, that's slicing things pretty finely and you have really super careful. Yeah. Two more questions. Yes, over here. <clears throat> um, okay, my question is kind of two part. One, I want to say thank you for coming. Um, okay, part of your speech, you talked about how there's an increased rate of suicide among individuals because of the shame of coming out, and then you referenced how it would be affected, that it may be affected because of the marriage. So the first part of my question is, how would allowing for the unions, allowing for the marriages, decrease the suicide number? And then also, what can we do now, since there are only five states that allow it, to work on decreasing the number? Yeah, <clears throat> that's an excellent question. And yeah, uh, obviously, I was there's a lot of dots that have to be connected to substantiate that claim I made. I wondered if anyone would ask me about that. Actually, because I thought, whoa, I'm really going out of limb here. Um, but I do believe that it is true. Um, there is some very serious new research that for the first time in uh, a very methodologically sound quantitative and qualitative way has looked at uh, the factors that go into family acceptance or rejection of LBT, LGBT youth in a really comprehensive fashion. The study, uh, the study looked at hundreds of families and it is just extremely clear that one of the main reasons that parents have such a difficult time still accepting that their children might be lesbian, gay, or bisexual, or transgender is the terrible grief that parents feel that their children will not be able to have socially accepted relationships and families and so forth. So. Again, the stigma, the message, the terrible messages that are sent uh, by marriage bans that reinforce that, uh, you know, at every turn, I think are just very directly connected to family rejection of children and that it would be extremely helpful. But you are right. Um, I mean, we can't really wait for that since it's going, you know, like, as you said, there's still 45 states where same-sex couples can't marry. Um, I mean, one of the things that I think is the most encouraging, uh, and it's again kind of apropos, I think, of some of the new strategies that folks here in Utah have developed and that are really a model now for all the other states, all the, you know, the many other states who are not going to be achieving marriage equality in the near future and are dealing with much more conservative social and political contexts. Um, there are some very serious conversations going on based on some of this new data with um, some of the leadership of the Mormon Church, other you know, conservative uh, spokespeople who are, because of the way it's being presented to them in a very non-confrontational fashion, in a very empirical fashion, willing to look at this data that literally 
this study literally identified the 10 behaviors that are most likely rejecting behaviors that are most likely to cause a young person to attempt suicide like uh, and the ones that are the most lethal are even one exposure to a therapist to just trying to change a ch uh, young person's sexual orientation increases the risk of suicide by a factor of five and that is even more extreme if that is combined with any sort of religiously based message of rejection and th that's just that has now been empirically demonstrated and people even conservative people even people who have religious beliefs that condemn same-sex relationships can hear that and modify their behavior they don't not necessarily and they're not modifying their beliefs but modify their behavior what they're saying the way they're handling the possibility that one of their family members might child children might be lesbian or gay bisexual or transgender I mean I think that is really some of the most important work that we could be doing and that we need to do much much more of I really do appreciate the way you've tried to create some common ground. And what it reminded me of is we have a very active group working against uh, marriage equality, the Sutherland Institute. And I was reminded of this also yesterday. There was a cardinal who spoke down at BYU. And they both start their argument by saying that the family is the basic unit of society. And of course, what they mean by family is what they call, quotation marks, natural family. So going back to the argument that you started with in terms of it, it shouldn't be just the individual versus democracy, or in this case here in Utah, the stand-in for democracy is the family. I'm wondering if you could give us some advice in terms of how to continue this dialogue and kind of work with that whole issue of the basic unit of society. Wow, that's so interesting. Yeah, and we, have, you know, we have just fought, we've sort of our, our side, so to speak, has fallen into or falls into too easily that language of individual rights. It's just it's it's it's, it's what comes naturally to mind, and it's a struggle. It requires like this conscious effort to be like, no, 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 this is not about individual rights. It's about family relationships. So I think again, just appropriating, rightfully so, that language of connection and family, and looking for that common ground. One of the things that um, there's also there's a lot of really exciting new stuff going on. So there's all this new data coming from California because in the aftermath of Prop 8, there's this like massive new field organization going on with thousands of volunteers now in Fresno, Bakersfield, Inland Empire, out there literally knocking on doors and having these conversations with people where you get this immediate feedback about what kind of messages do and don't work, and uh, this. The, one of the messages that we started out with was this idea of telling people, hey, well, so you have these religious views, um, but other people have different views, and would you agree that the, the law should not favor anybody's religious views? Well, that does not work. People are like, nope, I think the law should reflect my religious views. <laughs> I got no problem with that. <laughs> but what does work, so we're like, okay, bad message, get off that message. But what does work, and this makes sense, and I think it's consistent with what I'm trying to say, is asking people, okay, so what are the core values of your religion? And for almost everybody, there are things like being respectful of other people, loving other people, treating other people the way you want to be treated, and that, those values provide, are good for us, right? I mean, they provide a very powerful, again, shared framework and you know, just a basis for a huge amount of common ground. Thank you guys.